welcome. Today I have with you a very special guest who is a top attorney uh, with a specialty in parental alienation. Um, attorney Ashish Joshi, I wanted to just go straight into the interview and I want to open this with um, a question about this is something that I run into quite often in the support groups and we have the weekly Zoom calls where parents, some of the parents will come in with this sort of sense of dread where they say, you know, what's the point? You cannot fight at all in court. Um, you cannot win in court at all because the system rigs against parents who are alienated um, and um, it's it's all about money and there's corruption and all that kind of thing. So um, could we, Ashis, thank you so much for being here today. Would Could we just go straight into this question? Um, just, yeah, it's something that Sure, we can. Uh, first of all, thank you for having me, Petra. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. The work that you do is remarkable in terms of education, outreach, and letting people know what parental alienation is and how horrible it is for someone to go through it. To answer your question, uh, these cases are difficult, no, no doubt. And uh, if I were to look back on my career, I've had uh, plenty of losses. You know, I've had several, several cases where fathers, mothers, grandparents simply had to walk away from a relationship or just couldn't get anywhere. And sometimes it's because of uh, judges who don't understand what parental alienation is. Sometimes it's because uh, by the time the case goes to a trial, the child is 16, 17 years of age and simply too late to do much of uh, anything. Sometimes it's because of bad legal advice that uh, did not seek early intervention. And sometimes it's outright bias and uh, frankly, just a refusal uh, to hold a hearing. So it, it is true that these, these cases are very difficult and gut-wrenching to litigate in court and fight in court. But at the same time, uh, it's not uh, accurate to say that there is no hope, that there is no recourse. There are cases which uh, have uh, done remarkably well. There are judges, and we see more of these judges, thankfully, as we go on, who understand what this means and when it's necessary to intervene. I mean, I just uh, was talking to someone about this in another interview that we had a recent uh, great success story in a very remote uh, location in Michigan. You know, this is a rural county, not uh, too sophisticated in terms of litigation practice or access to mental health resources and all that compared to let's say Chicago or New York or San Francisco. But what mattered was that the judge took the time to learn the case. The judge was willing to understand what it meant. The judge was willing to understand what were the consequences of inaction. Uh, and we were, we were lucky to have that kind of a judge. On the other hand, there are plenty of cases where they simply refuse to do what uh, their job, which is to hold an evidentiary hearing and make findings of facts. Family law is interesting, Petra, in a way that, you know, if you have a civil jury trial or a criminal case, you have a, you have a pool of jury, you have a jurors before you present your case, and they find the facts, they make the, they make the fact finding exercise. And then it's up to the judge to make the rulings on the issues of law. And in criminal cases, for example, sentencing and whatnot. In family case, the judge just the whole thing. I mean, the judge makes the findings of fact, the yeah. judge makes the evidentiary rulings, the judge decides issues of custody, mental health intervention and everything. So it is difficult in that situation. And plus most family law courts are so backlogged and there's a heavy amount of docket congestion that it's by the time a case goes to trial, sometimes it's just too late. And last but not least, we continue to see this bad advice on the part of the lawyers who keep on telling their clients to show patience or refuse to intervene early, refuse to get a case to a trial, uh, all in the name of negotiation or trying to mediate a case. And don't get me wrong. I mean, mediation absolutely has its uh, value. 
you can negotiate a good outcome in a case of mild parental alienation where the alienating parent is willing to come to the table. There are psychoeducational tools that you can put into place for early intervention and you can have proper therapeutic intervention, proper unification without litigating, without going to court and spending money on lawyers and trials and everything. But those cases are very few. Unfortunately, what you see in litigation is are this moderate to severe cases, which were allowed to get so severe and so pathological because of refusal to early intervene in these cases or failure to early intervene in these cases. Yeah, so the aliens get empowered, right? Become more emboldened to, to create even more problems. So really it's it's possible and and i agree with you it's not it, um, we're not saying that it's easy it's definitely really difficult uh, it is not easy but it's possible to win in court and that the system does have a way of recognizing this and when you present the proper information evidence and follow the proper structure you can win in court right which bring us to actually the discussion today which is you wrote a book that is really a toolbox for parents and also professional practitioners when it comes to litigation in court, right? So Ashish Joshi uh, wrote a book called Litigating uh, Parental Alienation, which just got published by the family law um, section of the of the American Bar Association, right? So Ashish, um, why, why did you write this book? Okay, um, let me uh, pull up a screen if I may. Uh, I would like to show the people who are interested the book cover. Um, actually, before you get into that, I just wanted to um, say thank you for parents in the room. I already see questions. If you have questions, please go ahead and start posting it. We'll try to pick up as many questions as possible. And if you could please share this um, videos out. I saw Michelle sharing it out already. Thank you. You know, um, if you could, uh, if you're not comfortable sharing it in your own personal Facebook page, please share it in some groups that you are in so that other parents can join us and please like um, and if you haven't please subscribe to our mailing list on our website victim hero.com thank you go ahead ashish thank you petra so this is the cover of the book uh the book was released about uh two or three weeks ago by the american bar association and uh, the reason the main reason i want i wrote this book was to bring the two sides together you know the mental health community who has its own definition of parental alienation and the legal community comprising of judges, lawyers, guardians ad litem and minor children's counsel who litigate these cases in court but seem to lack a solid understanding of what parental alienation is. And there is this uh, approach about, uh, well, California looks at it this way, but New York does it this way or Michigan has an impression of alienation, which doesn't uh, compound with what Florida has. And that's false. Because if you look at these cases around the country, and I do these cases around the country, the science is the same. And you see trial courts after trial courts intervening when proper evidence is presented before them. That was one reason why uh, the Chief Justice of the Michigan Supreme Court wrote the foreword to this book. And uh, Chief Justice McCormick recognizes that alienation is a serious issue that family court judges have to deal with. You know, there's this myth out there that judges don't accept the theory of parental alienation. And that's not true. That was one reason why I wrote the book. Uh, for those who are interested, you can find uh, the book currently at the website of American Bar Association where you can get a print or an ebook copy. And in few months, it should be available on Amazon as well. But for now, the ABA is uh, shipping it out to whoever's interested. So let me take this uh, off. Well, we, should, we should probably mention that you don't have to be a member of the American Bar Association in order to buy the book. Correct. Anyone, anyone can buy the book. If your attorney or your lawyer is a member, then obviously members get a discounted price, the non-members but you don't have to be a member of the ABA to buy this book or any book for that matter from their website. There are several other books which are very informational. 
and you can go to this website and you can make your purchase at that website. No membership required. That's a good point, Petra. Thank you. So the one, the first reason was to build a bridge between the mental health and the legal communities into making the concepts uniform and focusing on how different courts around the country have defined parental alienation. What do they look at? What evidence do they uh, consider? What has been persuasive to these courts? What interventions have the courts made in these cases? And this is not a jurisdiction specific. One important thing the book talks about is that no matter where you are, California, New York, uh, Florida, Chicago, you know, Seattle, you know, these cases have uniformly viewed in a way by these courts. So the concept that I talk about is uniformly applicable. The second reason that I wrote the book was to debunk the fallacies and myths that keep on coming on to these cases. Frequently, I get into a case, let's say three years down the road, where alienation is so worse and has progressed from what used to be mild to moderate to a severe case of alienation. And the reason being that there was no early intervention. No one went to the court to ask for a trial. No one went to the court to ask for proper mental health legal intervention. No one tried to educate the judge as to what was really going about. Instead, you, we see motions being filed by lawyers and guardians and items in cases about parenting time and more access and issues regarding uh, you know, some violation of uh, Christmas time or holidays and whatnot. And that's the wrong way to approach a case of alienation. Because if it's a case of severe parental alienation, it's not a case of custody. It's not a case of parenting time. It's a case of child abuse. And it's a case of child protection. And that's how you need to frame the case for the court. You know, when you go to a court and you keep on filing motions for holiday time or more time or some co-parenting issues, the family judge is by default assume that here comes another high conflict case where parents are simply not being able to get together and decide. And it's one of those cases which I can just kick to mediation or for friend of the court investigations in some jurisdictions. And then that process takes a life of its own. In the meantime, alienation gets worse, is further entrenched, children start growing up, and the whole case is a different trajectory. Compare that to an approach where someone identifies alienation and walks into the court and tells the judge, this is not about the mom or dad missing Christmas. This is not about the kids not showing up at Thanksgiving. This is not about the lack of parenting time which we have promised, but this is about psychological abuse. This is about child protection. This is about these children being subjected to emotional and psychological abuse day after day, every day that they continue to live with the alienating parent. And we want an opportunity to present evidence to you, the judge, so we can do the right thing. And that's, what's, that's the approach that is needed. Now that doesn't mean, unfortunately, that you will get that chance. You know, there are several cases where the people have been tired of asking for a hearing or a trial and you never get around it. And we'll talk more about that. But there was what yet another reason why I wrote the book to debunk some of the fallacies that are, that are just in the legal community and world at large about parental alienation, that it doesn't exist, it's not supported by science, or the courts don't believe it, or if they do believe it, there's nothing you can do about it and all of those. And the lastly, the third point and the important one from my perspective, the most important one was to give the tools to the lawyers and targeted parents, lawyers who represent the children in these cases, referees, judges in, well, now you have a case of alienation, what to do about it? How do you figure out whether it's a case involving parental alienation or a case involving false allegations of alienation? How do you figure out whether uh, there is merit to this argument? When you do have evidence of alienation, well, what do you do about it? Does every case require removing the kids? 
Does every case require a specialized intervention program? Does every case require uh, sanctions? How do you enforce it? What if the children refuse to go? You know, what do you do with the guardian ad litem or minors counsel who seems to just keep on empowering or over empowering the children into rejecting a parent? What do you do in a situation where the kids are being put in the driver's seat and the kids tell the judge or people, uh, uh, adults in the room as to what they're gonna do? So we, I talk about real cases, I talk about case law, I talk about practice pointers, what has worked, what hasn't worked. And I also cite to the science supporting these theories. For example, one of the common misconception is that expert evidence on parental alienation is not acceptable. You know, the courts don't allow experts to talk about parental alienation. And then they conflate that term parental alienation with parental alienation syndrome. And you are again, chasing the theories in rabbit hole of a different nature by that. So I address all these issues and I wrote this book and it's basically about past 10 to 15 years of my litigating experience of this cases in different courts around America. That's what caused to, for me to write this book. Thank you, thank you. And, and you touch on so many important topics that I really want to kind of, for us to unpack a lot of that. Um, I, want, I wanted to say thank you to uh, Karen and Candice for sharing this um, interview. And, um, and one of the points that we, you were talking about was that um, the sort of the different views in different uh, jurisdiction, which is so important because I mean, right now, we have viewers that are coming from all around the world, actually, not just around the country. We have Tamara's from Australia. We have Carol from Kenya. You know, um, hi Jose, hi Paul. We're gonna talk about your question in a minute. Bobby, uh, thank you. Actually, Paul said um, that he is so grateful for you because he found you to be one of the most valuable resources out there. Thank you. So, so Paul actually said that. Um, Claudia, hi, thank you. Um, Jason, hi. Um, and then, yeah, we have a bunch of questions. Thank you, Bobby. We're gonna dig into some of that. Hi, Kara and Candice. Um, yeah, thank you everyone. So yeah, so it's so important you mentioned about like how really it's the same issue and then people are trying to pretend that it's somehow different in Michigan as opposed to New York or California. The reality of it is it's something that's very real that's happening to the children and it and and the point about how you have to frame it that it's a child protection problem. This is not Two parents arguing. This is not a dispute over. Yeah, it, it's it's not two people don't get along. This is a psychological abuse. So let me give you an example. Yeah. You know, Appendix B in my book. Okay, here's where I talk about examples of alienating strategies that have been documented in the courts. Now, in just the first two pages, I talk about cases from Vermont. Arkansas, Illinois, New York, Idaho, Tennessee, Missouri, and other, other cases, other jurisdictions, you know? So it's not accurate to say that there are many parts of this country that have refused to acknowledge alienation. That's not true. Yes, there are some cases which have said that parental alienation syndrome doesn't seem to be supported by scientific evidence and it's controversial theory and whatnot. But judges have moved from that. You know, we have come a long way from that. We are talking about alienating behaviors, which every court takes note of. We are talking about signs of alienation in the child, pathological behaviors of the children who are subjected to these behaviors. And the courts have taken notice of that. And America is not the only country. You know, I wrote a chapter in the book, Parental Alienation, Science and Law, that came out last year in 2020. The book was edited by Dr. William Burnett and Dr. Demosthenes Lorandos. And I wrote a chapter on international issues on alienation. And I discussed all these countries, Canada, UK, India, Australia, New Zealand, I mean, we have a remarkable convergence of this country's understanding the concept of alienation and acting to do something about it. 
I mean, some of them have made alienation a crime. In Brazil, it's a crime to commit parental alienation. You know, it, so it's a, it's a serious issue. So it's not true that uh, it's only recognized by some courts and not others. There, there are bad decisions, of course. There are decisions where the judges have held, well, yes, we do see signs of alienation, unfortunately. However, it's too late to do anything because the kids are 15 or 16 years old. And that goes against the research in the field because the research shows that even with the older children, even with the kids who are 16, 17 and plus, if you have proper intervention, a proper specialized program for reunification, together with a temporary no contact period between the alienating parent and the children, we have success. We have success studies. So, but nevertheless, perhaps that judge wasn't educated on that. Perhaps that judge didn't want to go there. So there are some bad decisions, like in any field of law. You know, you take a criminal justice, you take a intellectual property, corporate law. There are good decisions and bad decisions. But overwhelming amount of courts in America have absolutely acknowledged the concept of alienation. And you see interventions after interventions from the court. Can we talk about the criteria for admissibility of expert testimony on parental alienation? Because clearly we need to be able to educate the judges. And, and so for your case, you wanted to build that and, and show that the potential psychological abuse to the children, you, you need to be able to bring experts into the case, right? So how do we get the experts in? Well, that actually depends on the jurisdiction. Because broadly speaking, uh, the country is divided into what uh, the lawyers call the Daubert states and the Fry states. And these are two uh, Supreme Court decisions or which have admissibility standards for expert testimony. Daubert, just to put it uh, in a very uh, generalized manner, before you present expert testimony, you, the proponent of the expert evidence has to show to the court that the proposed expert testimony is helpful to the court, the fact finder, the judge, is based on the reliable uh, principles of science, uh, reliability and validity, you have to demonstrate that, that it's not basically uh, junk science, the principle is firmly established in the scientific community. And third, it meets the facts of this case. And you can do that with alienation. No doubt about it. In fact, my one entire chapter of my book, I devote to how to present expert testimonies in family court on alienation. The Fry standard is uh, generalized, basically saying that the uh, proposed testimony must be accepted, well accepted in the general scientific community. And the testimony about parental alienation, expert testimony about that has passed Daubert and fry gatekeeping. You know, just last year, we had two decisions, actually 2019 and 2020, we saw two good decisions, one from Maine and one from Pennsylvania, which basically say, yes, it passes this Daubert and fry gatekeeping. But you have to do the hard work. Before you have an expert come and say, yes, there's alienation and here's what to do about it. You have to lay the foundation. And it is critical to make sure that you do it properly. And it also depends upon your jurisdiction and the judge that you are in front of. If you happen to be in front of a judge who has been involved in cases of alienation, who has dealt with sophisticated cases of child enmeshment, psychological abuse, then perhaps you are already half the way there in terms of the court's understanding of this concept. But you don't have the luxury to assume that. The better way to go about it is to assume that this court simply knows nothing about the concept of alienation. And remember, you're not just trying to educate the trial court. You're also making a good record for the appellate court to sustain if you do happen to win at the trial court. So you lay the foundation of what alienation is. You lay the foundation of the empirical support behind the theory of alienation. You lay the foundation of the research studies done by Dr. Amy Baker and others. 
which lends support to this theory. Then you talk about, well, what is it? How does it affect the children? What can be done about it? Why it's considered to be psychological abuse? What are the consequences of inaction? What, are the, what is the risk of not uh, enough action? All those things. And then you start connecting the dots for the court as to, well, what happens in this case? What's the evidence? Why do we believe it's an alienation case? And what usually compels a court are actual stories, not just raw data and hard uh, facts and some flow charts and spreadsheets, but what is it like to be a targeted parent? What is it to be in the shoes of a rejected parent? You know, stories move people. Stories move judges. They need to understand that it's not just about quantity. It's not just about the kid refusing to see the dad for Christmas or the dad or mom losing out so many days by where parenting time was lost. It's about the quality as well. What happens when that alienated child does come to visit the targeted parent? What is it like to have the child holed up in the room with the door closed, headphones on, just zonked out, refusing to engage, refusing to talk, refusing to speak, not have any meals together, not do any activities together? It's like having a completely different person in your house. And those things have to be brought out at trial for the court to understand the severe pathology underlying these behaviors and why we need intervention. Because it's so easy to just assume that, oh, we, you know what, just go for traditional therapy. So-and-so is a good counselor down the road. We know just so Dr. So-and-so is gonna fix it. No big deal, just calm down mom, calm down dad. And you have to get beyond that because it is so counterintuitive. And that's where you also need to invest time in dealing with the guardians at Lighten or minors counsel who simply will unfortunately try to advocate what the child wishes without first considering as to what's in the child's best interest. Of course, not all people are the same. I mean, there are great professionals. I have. Had, I've been fortunate enough to work with some of the top-notch professionals who have been guardians at Lighten, who understood the case and went and told the judge, my client, the child, wishes to have nothing to do with the mother. But if you were to do that, Your Honor, that would be tremendously unfair and not in the best interest of the child because the mother is not a bad parent, but here we have a case of alienation and we in fact need to do the opposite. So it depends on the professionals, of course. Right. Could, could we address this thing? I see this in the chat room right now, but I also see it a lot um, where it's people say, oh, let's fight this, but don't call it parental alienation. Can you, can you comment about that? Nonsense. One word. Absolute nonsense. You have to call spade a spade. The term parental alienation is accepted by the courts. Why would you not call it that? When you have so much data, when you have so much research showing how parental alienation works, what it does, why would you call it something different? What would you call it? Yeah. And then, I, I, and then you're chasing ghosts. I mean, we are not afraid to call domestic violence, domestic violence. We are not afraid to call sociopathy, sociopathy, a psychopathic behaviors, so and so. There is a body of research that shows what the concept of alienation means, what it results in, how to overcome it, how to counteract it. We have court decisions where the courts have used this term as well. So I don't understand the reason why, would you, why you would not say that. Yes, the courts have used other terms as well. Sometimes they've used uh, pathological parenting. And it's also true that not all cases of a child's rejection of a parent is by default an alienation case. There could be many other reasons why there's a dysfunction in the relationship. There could be many reasons why a child is refusing to see a parent or rejecting a parent or the relationship needs repair. It doesn't have to be parental alienation, but if it is alienation, then you have to use that term. If your lawyer tells you that, well, despite the case being parental alienation, we simply can't use it, because this judge or that county doesn't really 
recognize that, that's false. It's time to change lawyers or to challenge the judge on it. Right. And I have yet to see a jurisdiction that flat out says, we do not accept any data or any testimony regarding parental alienation. You will find cases which still challenge the theory of parental alienation syndrome. But to my knowledge, there are no cases where a judge has said that alienating behaviors, despite there being evidence of alienating behaviors and despite there being signs of alienation in the children, we refuse to accept the concept of parental alienation. Right, right. Yeah, I'm, I'm really tired of this debate over the naming convention. You know, let's, let's, yeah, let's just, this is what it is. Just stop pushing it around and then not focusing on the solution of this. It's um, so- And it's worse than that, you are undermining your own case. If you don't argue alienation in a case where there is alienation, you are undermining your own case because then by default, the real good programs of reunification that have shown to work in this situation are out because then the other side is going to come and argue, well, this is not a case of alienation. Why are you even talking about those our programs, Your Honor? That we have, the other side has conceded that this is not parental alienation. They're not using the term. So let's not even talk about the good programs that have worked. Let's not even talk about the no contact period. Let's not even talk about temporary change of custody or anything of that nature, because we are not using the term. So that's uh, setting someone up for failure that's sabotaging your own case. And I don't know why someone would do that. Um, could you talk about the misinformation about parental alienation? Because, I mean, and you touch on it quite a bit already, but can we, let's, let's get into it. I mean, there's, um, there's, this, there's this thing, there's this, uh, I guess, um, movement where they're pushing this thing about how parental alienation is junk science and that it's something that was only created to for abusive fathers you know in domestic violence situation when the mothers try to protect the children and then these abusive fathers and use this term to take the custody away from the mothers and when he claimed this parental alienation immediately or almost most of the case the mother immediately lose custody can, can we talk about this Sure. So th there are several uh, fallacies and misconceptions or myths out there about alienation. One of them is that the theory of parental alienation was invented by the child psychiatrist, Richard Gardner, to be used as a shield by abusive men who were being held accountable by their courts and to hide behind their views. That when men who were abusive where try to make held accountable for their abusive actions, they in turn came in alleged parental alienation to steal custody away from women. And that's false. That's a myth. There, there is also a false uh, theory out there that judges, when the theory of alienation is used against allegations of domestic violence, automatically the person using alienation wins and the person complaining about domestic violence loses. That's not true. A few months ago, the American Psychological Association published a peer-reviewed paper in their publication written by Dr. Jennifer Harmon out of Colorado and Dr. Demosthenes Lorandos out of Michigan. And this is in one of the most prestigious journals of America, peer-reviewed study which demonstrated that that theory is false. Yes, the courts have intervened and the courts have taken measures, including changing custody, where they have found alienating behaviors and signs of alienation. In other words, where there is evidence of alienation, the courts have done something as they darn well should. But it's not because of any particular gender where fathers have been alienating, they have been held accountable. Where mothers have been alienating, they have been held accountable. And you also see cases where the theory of alienation is tried to use uh, in an inappropriate manner. You also see cases where the judges have said that uh, 
I'm not just going to make up genders. It could be any gender, but let's say father accuses mother of alienation, but it's not true. Father has been abusive and father has, have father has engaged in behaviors that have been found abusive by the protective services or otherwise. And it's not a case of alienation. It's a legitimate estrangement case that the child has rejected the parent for a good reason. It could be severe alcoholism, uh, severe uh, physical abusive behavior, concerns about sexual abuse, concerns about uh, neglect. The parent was never present during the child's formative years. So courts do look at that evidence, but this is not a gender issue. This is not dad's right versus women's right. This is not, uh, and we have decisions that say that as well. We have a case from New York and other places that have specifically held that it's not a simplistic analysis. This is not a gender war. It's a pathological behavior, set of behaviors that unfortunately has been engaged by both genders. You know, we have, I have a list of cases where moms have behaved badly. And I have a list of cases from all around the country where dads have behaved badly as well. So that's number one myth. The other myth which we often come across in courts is this notion that uh, sometimes it's just too late that you really can't do anything with the kids are 15 years old or 16 years old or otherwise, that despite the alienation, you simply have to just walk away and hope that the kids come back when they're 18 or 20 or 25. And that's not true either. And we have success study outcomes, uh, two great peer, again, peer reviewed articles published by Richard Warshak that have shown that even in cases of older children, even in those cases where appropriate program of reunification is put in place, and when the alienated child is physically separated from the alienating parent on a temporary basis, we can work things around. Those children do come back. Yeah, so, have, uh, yeah once you lift that pressure, right? Because there's this pressure that the alienating parents are putting on the children put things in, in the middle of this loyalty conflict and the children feel that they have to choose. So once you lift that pressure, the children now are free to be themselves and the authentic self bring back that love again, right? So it, it's, it's big. They need, the children need an opportunity to break through the loyalty bind. And it doesn't happen in a day, doesn't happen in two days, it takes time. So the specialized program for intervention, like for example, turning points for families out of New York or family bridges, uh, and there are other programs as well in uh, their satellite versions in different parts. After you go through the specialized program, you have to, there has to be a temporary no contact so that the alienated child doesn't go back into the poisonous environment right away. And in the meantime, the alienating parent should also be required to take a psychoeducational course, some sort of counseling to help them understand what happened because of their behaviors, why these behaviors are so bad. And then there has to be a review hearing and the court has to gauge whether the alienating parent has truly understood what happened, has truly been forthright in participating in the sessions and is willing to agree not to engage in those behaviors going forward. You know, Petra, put this in a different context. Let's say you have a situation where one parent has been found to have, to have been severely alcoholic or a drug abuser. And because of that, the child was in danger and the child was taken away and the parent was put in a rehab. No judge will simply give the kid back to that parent Unless that, unless that parent demonstrates that he or she has been sober for a period of time, that they've gone through a rehab facility, that they have gone through therapy, and they are willing to now tell the court that they don't have that problem and they want their parenting time back. And they have done what was required of them, jump through the hoops, you know, all of those. Even in that situation, the court will take baby steps the court will start with supervised visitation. 
the court will require random testing, random uh, checking of alcohol testing, drug testing. And once you have a period of time when the parent is able to demonstrate that there are no issues and he or she is clean and sober, then you go back to normal parenting time. Why is alienation case any different? It's psychological abuse. And that the burden should be on the alienating parent to demonstrate that they have learned the lesson and they have understood how their behaviors could severely impact the child for the rest of his or her life. And then we transition back, but not if there's no automatic switch that at the end of 40 or 60 days, it goes back to 50-50. Otherwise you see regression and going back to same old behaviors. Talking about so many aspects there. So, what do you focus on when proving parental alienation cases? Three main things. One, educating the court that parental alienation is real. It exists, it's a real thing, there's scientific support for it, and other courts have acknowledged it as well. That's number one. Second, you have to educate the court and show the court that parental alienation is existing in this particular case. That we are not making speculative assumptions. We are not simply assuming that because little Johnny doesn't want uh, to spend time with the dad, there must be parental alienation. No, we have evidence of alienating behaviors and we have evidence of signs of alienation. So I like to use the five factor model when I try these cases in the courts, which I basically show that, uh, just to digress a little bit, the five factors are one, you have to show that the child is resisting contact or rejecting a parent. There, there is a severe strain on the relationship. It's not just contact refusal in and of itself, but even when the child does see the parent, there's a rejection of the parent, there's refusal to engage with the parent, there is something wrong in the relationship at a major level. Factor number two is that there used to exist a normal, loving, healthy relationship between that rejected parent, now rejected parent and the child, not too long ago. That before the separation or before the divorce or before the problems started to arise, we have a historical basis, a good baseline of a really good, the loving relationship that the parent who's being now rejected has been an involved parent throughout the child's life. Factor three is absence of serious abusive or neglectful behavior. So the parent who's being rejected has not engaged in severely abusive or neglectful behavior. And this is important. This is a factor that is most applicable in most cases, in litigation cases because there are always excuses about why that parent is bad, why the rejected parent quote unquote deserves this, you know? And we are not talking about a perfect parent. We are not talking about suboptimal parenting decisions or one parent being a little bit authoritative and the other parent being more permissive. We are not talking about a parent missing some uh, soccer games or aligned with the child in terms of hobbies or interests. For example, Johnny loves soccer and dad loves soccer. So of course they're together and Johnny doesn't want to see mom. Now, we are talking about presence of significantly abusive behaviors. That's a high standard and not just allegations, but concrete findings. Factor four is the presence of alienating strategies. Some of the 17 well-known strategies of alienation, we, have, we need to see evidence of those. Not all 17 have to be present, but some do. It could be six, seven, four, whatever it is, depending on the case. And finally, we see signs of alienation in the child. So together, that five-factor model falls in the second thing that I talked about, that alienation exists in this case. You gotta show that. And finally, you have to show to the court that children need intervention, that this problem is not going to go away on its own. It's you have to wrestle with it. We have to put an intervention in place. It's not just like, like if the dad comes down and mom comes down and parties stop filing motion and the lawyers just take a stand back, it's gonna resolve itself. No, it doesn't. 
This is a psychological issue. It needs intervention. You need to convince the court that proper intervention is needed, and then you lay the options on the table. What are the options? Here are the few options uh, from the specialized program to uh, counseling and some psychoeducational tools, depending on the case, whatever is applicable. And even after putting that intervention in place, it's always better to have a review hearing scheduled in 45 to 60 or 90 days. So that if things are not working, if things continue, if alienating behaviors continue to arise and continue to take place, you go back to the court and talk about what's not working. Unfortunately, this all is not just time intensive and difficult, but it's also financially prohibitive at times. It takes money, unfortunately. You need to get proper expert. You need to uh, get lawyers who understand this, put the case together. On top of it, you might have guardians at light term, minors counsel, therapists, all of them working on the case. So I wish there were legal aid uh, available for these cases from counties and support, but uh, most don't. Um, I wanted to just highlight a few things that you mentioned there. And um, by the way, thank you, Jason and Laurie for sharing this um, interview. So um, one of the first thing is about the paper uh, by Dr. Harmon and Dr. Lorenders. Um, so Harmon Lorenders, 2020, uh, that paper, we have that on our website uh, at victimtohero.com if you want to search on that. Um, it's, it's a very, very thorough paper examine cases and cases uh, on the appellate level looking at how the system play out when parental alienation is being used. And um, it totally proved that it's the, the court system recognized parental alienation and when it's proven things are being done and that it's not a gender issues. So these are the things that, that you just talk about and I want parents to know where to find it. One, and the second thing I want to mention is that- May, may uh, I say something, Petra? Yeah. The, what you just said. So the paper is freely available to anyone who wants to read it. I, I will in fact uh, send it to you. You can post it on your link or somewhere. But if, the, if your audience wishes to watch Dr. Dr. Harmon and Dr. Lorandos explain their findings. They can watch the video, which is available on PAFG, uh, Parental Alienation Study Group, PAFG's YouTube channel. There's a YouTube channel on PAFG, and if they search Harmon Lorandos, I did their interview about a month ago. I moderated them, uh, their discussion, and both Dr. Harmon and Dr. Lorandos explain what they found. What was the study comprised of and what it means in practical terms? And I think that's a free video that anyone can watch. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Um, yeah. And then the other thing um, I want to mention is you, you, the five factor models. We also have that five factor model on our website. If you want to look it up, uh, victimtohero.com. And one um, factor on there. Um, is to prove that the rejected parent, the targeted parent, is not abusive or neglectful of the children. I want to emphasize that because this this movement that trying to say that parental alienation is a tool for abusive parents, no, none of the professional um, community is ever going to support putting children into the hands of abusive parents. So this factor is there. It's not, you know, you, you can't just say, oh, parental alienation when you are abusive and, and create domestic violence or any, anything like that. The, the model is there to try to make sure that factor clearly identify that you can't just claim parental alienation if you are an abusive parent, right? So uh, I wanted to point that out as well. Um, okay, so let's get back to, uh, so, you know, we're talking about these three main things that's really important to to um, to prove cases in parental alienation. So, a lot of parents still have trouble, right? It's still not easy. It's still challenging. So, what are the biggest challenges in fighting these cases? That's a good question. Uh, resources, I would say, is number one. You know. These cases are sometimes they get frightfully expensive, especially if a lot of time has been wasted early on 
in filing motions that go nowhere or trying to negotiate with the other side or simply just going to courts but not asking for an evidentiary hearing. So all that uh, exercise is usually a waste of time, effort, and money. But if I were to sit back and look at uh, alienation cases across the country, and if I were to ask what's one thing that needs to happen that would really change how the system views the cases of alienation, my answer would be accountability. There's a tremendous lack of accountability for the professionals involved in the system. There's no, first of all, requirement that a guardian ad litem or a child's attorney who's appointed in a case involving alienation is competent, knowledgeable, trained, or experienced in these cases. And that's, that's a huge issue. If you put someone who has no understanding of alienation in front of an alienated child, that person is going to immediately go and advocate what the child wants. Because alienated children come across as really respectful, really good, obedient, nice little kids in all the spheres of life, except the targeted parent. So the professionals simply make a mistake by assuming that, oh, the kid, the kid's great in school. All the teachers rave about the kid. The kid's very polite, very respectful. There's a loving bond between the kid and the favored parent. The kid's respectful towards me as well. Something must be wrong with the other parent yeah. you know, to deserve this. So that's why these cases are counterintuitive. They have to be able to see beyond that. They have to question as to why is the child rejecting the relationship. The why has to be questioned again and again. So there is no accountability for incompetent professionals to keep on getting these cases again and again. Second, there is no accountability for false allegations. If there is an allegation of abuse that is made and investigated by protective services and there's substantiation of that abuse, everything kicks into gear. You have a safety plan. The judge wants to know, talk about it. The child has to be protected. The offending parent has to go to anger management classes or whatever other classes are required. All the entire system kicks into gear. We have domestic violence, victims advocate in place, all of it. And as it should be, because abuse should not be tolerated. If there is abuse, absolutely address it. But what happens in cases where there are repeated false allegations and all the unsubstantiation? You see cases after cases where one parent keeps on filing false complaints, the protective services keeps on investigating false complaints, unsubstantiation, 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 physical abuse allegations, sex abuse allegations, nothing going anywhere, but there is no accountability for those false allegations. Yeah. So that needs to change. I mean, there's obviously always a tension between we don't want to be too strict because we don't want to chill any reporting. We don't, we don't want there to be a chilling factor and uh, we want people to be able to complain when there's suspicion of abuse, by all means but it has to be reasonable. And you have to take into account of an alienating parent who is vindictive, who is pathological in, in his or her approach, who is making these false allegations again and again. You know, Petra, there are cases where the judges have found how pathological and how disruptive it is for a child to go through these repeated investigations. Imagine this where a little kid has to undergo medical examinations for alleged sexual abuse, where a little kid has to talk to the police officers again and again, where children are pulled out of the school classrooms by the CPS protective services workers so they can question them about what mom or dad allegedly did. I mean, they are being robbed of their normal childhood. They are being robbed of their precious memories with the parent who has done nothing wrong. But there's absolutely zero accountability for false allegations. And that needs to change. The other thing that needs to change, change sorry, go on. How do we change that? I mean, that is such a big problem. I mean, I, I, 
I've interviewed uh, over 700 cases now, and it very often is involved false allegation after false, just like you said, you know, involving either the CPS or the police or the school. And how do we hold these false allegation alienators accountable? How do, how do, I mean, yes, we're talking about professional is one side, but the alienators themselves, you know, how do we hold them accountable? Can we take them to court for civil cases or what are we doing here? We can. We can, and uh, people have. There have been civil lawsuits filed uh, alleging uh, tortious uh, claims like uh, intentional infliction of emotional distress, defamation at times. But again, those cases take money because unlike the cases involving uh, slip and fall or personal injury, you know, where lawyers are willing to take those on a contingency because there's an insurance company at the back end where you are guaranteed to get paid if you have a meritorious claim, these cases don't have that. So there's no big uh, payout that uh, lawyers can uh, focus on or could bank on by bringing these cases. So most lawyers will not take a case like this on a contingency. They will take it if you have, uh, if you can afford to pay them. So how many parents actually have resources to go and file a civil lawsuit on top of fighting battles in the family code and on top of the CPS and police and all of that? Very few. So that's a major obstacle. But even, I mean, let's start uh, about accountability in the very area where we are in, family courts. Even when it's clearly apparent that the minor's counsel or the guardian ad litem or even the judge is simply not getting it, that they are ignoring the evidence in front of them, many lawyers will not take the step to question them, to call it out, to file a motion for discharge of the guardian ad litem, to file a motion to discharge the minor's counsel, to file a motion to ask for the judge's recusal because of uh, evident bias, because of the refusal to hold an evidentiary hearing, or take it to an appeal to demand an evidentiary hearing. You know, there have been cases, there was a uh, recent case in Colorado in 2020, I believe, where the Colorado Supreme Court not only acknowledged the concept of parental alienation, but remanded the matter back to the trial court, stating that you need to hold an evidentiary hearing. You simply can't ignore the allegations of alienation. You simply can't say, well, they may not be true, their dad or mom is crying wolf again. No, even if that's true, you could hold the litigants accountable by awarding fees or sanctions if it was a false allegation or if it was made in bad faith. But you need to hold a fact-finding exercise to figure out if it is alienation. Because if it is, there needs to be an intervention. So you need more of those pushback. What unfortunately happens is that lawyers simply come back and tell the clients, it's never going to work. You're never gonna get anywhere. So just accept the reality, work in therapy, and slowly you will get back to where you were and just be passive, show empathy, don't be aggressive. And this is bad advice because this is not supported by science. Then I think one of the major issues in the alienation case is when the lawyer doesn't stay in his or her lane and starts giving parenting advice. Right, that's terrible. And, and, and that, that makes it worse. You know, you, have, you are talking to a parent who is already being rejected by alienation. And then on top of it, you are trying to give parenting advice to that parent without understanding what's causing that dysfunction. And that's not the job of the lawyers. That's the job of the mental health professionals or parenting coaches. So it's a, it's a system-wide issue. And it's not just in family law. I mean, we are talking about accountability in many of the areas. I mean, there's a huge debate going on right now about immunity. You know, qualified immunity, quasi-judicial immunity, even judicial immunity, how far it needs to go and where can the accountability come in? Because if every action, we, regardless of it being grossly negligent or in bad faith is immune from any repercussion, how are we going to assure that the professionals are competent and are doing the job that they were picked to do in the first place? You're talking about immunity for the judges and... and 
I'm talking about immunity for uh, all court appointed professionals, not just judicial immunity, but I'm talking about uh, quasi judicial immunity, which is often uh, routinely granted to court appointed professionals such as guardians ad litem, court appointed therapists, uh, court appointed children's counsel. Uh, so you were talking about how it's very difficult and expensive for parents to try to fight, for example, this in the civil case, trying to get damages. Um, can we, for example, perjury is a felony uh, in a lot of places. Um, is there a, an option and how would parents find a way to get that in the criminal courts, getting the district attorney office maybe? Can, can, is there a way for us? I mean, it seems like they don't take these cases. Is that is that true, or is that or is that that parents think, don't know the right? I think, there's a, I think there's a kernel of truth in there. Uh, I would be very skeptical of uh, trying to pursue a district attorney to bring a case for perjury. Uh, because think about it. When you go to, when you talk to district attorney's office, we are talking about district attorneys and the prosecuting attorneys already having a busy docket of handling cases involving child sexual abuse, rape, assault, you know, robberies, this and that, felonies, misdemeanor already. On top of it, you walk in there and you have a transcript of a deposition or in court evidence of someone who said X, Y, and Z under oath how it's false and you want them to bring charges. Usually they are already skeptical of being used as pawns in someone's custody litigation. That's when the district attorney's office take a step back because they are very concerned that either mom or dad is going to triangulate their office and use them as a, as a weapon against other party. So there is that natural skepticism involved in stepping into a custody dispute. But it depends on the level of perjury. I mean, you can start by filing a motion for sanctions, like in the court where the perjury was committed. If the court holds that it was perjury and there's a finding made of perjury, you are already on a solid ground to then request criminal prosecution. Because then the job of the district attorney's office is easier. There is a court finding of perjury already. But start seeking, start seeking accountability. It has to be before the, it can be for the same judge in the same courthouse, but the more passes you give, the, it's gonna continue. One of the most, uh, it, I usually am very concerned when a treating therapist starts sending letters to the court or starts writing affidavit in a, a line with the alienating parent. And if I see that happening, I try to call it out every single time. I file a motion seeking sanctions, asking the court that the treating therapy should be immediately stopped. That's an impermissible role. You can't be a treating therapist and a forensic therapist at the same time. You can't wear two hats. You can also file a licensing complaint against a professional and question that behavior. You can subpoena the records to show what's going on in therapy because often alienation involves that. It's a common alienating strategy to triangulate therapists, CPS workers, school teachers, and others who make no effort to seek out collateral information. Often you see signs of these ex parte motions being granted by the judge suspending someone's time with just one side of allegations. No one did the investigation to find out what actually happened in parenting time. No one called the father or the mother who's being accused of these bad behaviors. And by the time you get to the court a few weeks down the road and challenge it, sometimes your parenting time has been suspended for weeks and you are already on the slippery slope downhill and you have to get back to where you were. So there are some serious concerns and we need to call these behaviors out. But there's unfortunately not one answer where, where you can say, okay, fix this and the whole system is going to be fixed overnight. So um, we actually ran out of time. And there are many parents wanted to find out a way of um, contacting you. Um, I think you, do you have a slide that may have your information that you could share? Um, um, well, my, it's a, my law firm is Joshi Attorneys. So the website is www.joshi, J-O-S-H-I, attorneys, plural, 
www.ashkarsingh.com. And oh. you can uh, contact me through the website as well. Yeah, if you guys just Google his name, actually, you will find his um, his uh, law firm website, and you contact you can contact him through that. Um, uh, and then we are going to make sure that we're going to put a, um, a a link to his website as well on on this video um, later. So, um, any parting advice for targeted parents who are fighting parental alienation in courts? Uh, yes, there's hope. Don't give up. There are cases where courts have intervened and provided the necessary intervention. If your lawyer needs help, if your lawyer wants to brainstorm, I'd be happy to get on the phone with your lawyer to talk about it. Uh, we talk about my book. If you read the book, there are plenty of cases in there and solid resources that you can help yourself or your lawyer with. And these are tough cases. I mean, hang on. Your children are worth it worth the fight thank you thank you so much for your time this has been amazing like so insightful and so much information i wish we could just have like days and just talk all days <laughs> there's so many questions we couldn't even pick up all the kick the question in the chat room but thank you so and much more importantly petra thank you for what you are doing and this okay. was truly important thank you so much uh, and thank you everyone please like this video and please share Thank you so much, and we'll see you on Saturday on another conversation uh, with National Parents Organization.